Hi, and welcome to the Rare Business Podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm a consultant, advisor, researcher, and writer on all things related to customer service and customer experience. Through this podcast, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, and leading thinkers about what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees in this fast-moving modern age that we live in. If this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then welcome. And please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com, as I've now completed over 250 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then thank you for returning, and I'll aim to do a good enough job to keep you coming back week after week. Anyway, that's enough from me right now. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today, I have my good friend, Minter Dial, who is variously described as a storyteller, an author, a filmmaker, a consultant, a general troublemaker, but he's also a deadhead. Hi, Minter. How are you doing? Hey, Adrian. Happy New Year. Thanks for having me on the show. You're very welcome. And same to you, sir. So, Minter, for the benefit of our listeners and also the readers of the highlights, can you tell us a little bit about you and also about the work that you do? Right. So I'm a 54-year-old living in London, and I spend my time trying to help companies really figure out their purpose and brand. Mm Mm-hmm and how digital can help drive that idea and their business. That's sort of, in a summary, what I do for my job. As you said, I'm a deadhead, so pretty much every day I also spend 30 minutes playing guitar, Mm. and about 80% of that is gonna be some dead tune or another. (laughs) Excellent. And for all those people that don't know what a deadhead means, it's not nothing out of a not not a, something out of a horror film. It's actually he's a loyal follower of the Grateful Dead and has been for I would assume decades. Indeed, my very first show was at the Rainbow Theatre in 1981 in London, and I've since seen them somewhere close to 200 times. There you go, so, ladies and gentlemen, a real a real fan. But that's not what we're what we're here to talk about today, Minter, is it? It's no. uh, you're, we're here to talk about your new book which is called Artificial Empathy, putting heart into, into business and artificial intelligence. Um, I love the little play on the words, the artificial bit, but can you tell us about the book and how it came about and sort of what its main thesis, just to frame a bit of the conversation uh, before we get stuck into it? Well, I, I think it's important to start with how it came about. Okay. And, and, and initially the, the notion started with this, it's my own, self-evaluation with regard to my own empathy mm-hmm. and I had a couple of personal situations I I lost a very dear friend um, and and going through that process with him and then after his death the with the family and and trying to be in the shoes of the person who's going through what he went through and and talking with the family it sort of opened my eyes to well hmm how does one actually become aware and understand a situation in which we've never been. Right. And that that really started me on my path to try to figure out really just how empathic do I think I am? Because I I suppose with, let's say, unfortunate awareness, self-awareness, sometimes one might overestimate one's ability to be self-aware, to be as empathic. So that, that, let's say, that's sort of part of the germ that got me going in this. Mm -hmm. And then as far as what the book is endeavoring to do, it it looks at empathy. There's a level setting as to what is empathy. Mm -hmm. But the game plan is to try to help understand why, whether it's in life or in business, one needs to have more empathy and why it's actually going to be instrumental in driving your business. Okay. So before we can actually get into some of the, 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 the detail on that, because I think that's really interesting, because when I, when I read the book, it's, it, forgive me, but the, 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 the way that it, it read to me was it felt like a, a, almost like a personal narrative. It's like a process of self-discovery in many ways, is that you were almost like lifting the, the different leaves or peeling the layers, as it, as it were, as you went through it, which I thought was, I thought was really interesting because it's just, it felt like we were going deeper and deeper and deeper into it. But before we get into that, I also know that there's a connection with your wife. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the, the book also came about as a result of a dinner 
date that you had with your wife on a night out. So can you tell me about that? Because I think it's a funny story. Well, as you say, it's a very personal element. And 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 um, in in the work I did with Caleb in in Future Proof, one uh-huh. of the things that Caleb brought to me was to how to open myself up. And try not to be quite as business oriented, too factual and scientific about anything I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. And so, in a hat tip to the Caleb way, I really did want to weave this as a personal narrative, and right. and and hopefully through that storytelling, become make it more engaging than just sort of ipso facto describing research about empathy and so on. Right. So as far as this particular instance was concerned, I I got signed up for an experiment that was run out of Berlin Mm -hmm. by a group called the Feld Studio. And they had me for five days interacting with an empathic chatbot. Right. Which essentially essentially was an app on my telephone. But in in that this was a five-day commitment, it really meant that whenever I had two seconds in those five days, it was a natural instinct to go back to the bot that was constantly at my behest and my behoof, ready to interact with me. Mm. And so I had to, uh, to begin with, I was sort of a bit curious. Mm-hmm. And and then what's an empathic bot? And how does that actually work? Mm. And, and I was a little bit in the mode of following it, if you will, because it would be sending out questions and I'd answer and I'd react. And, and then little by little, I realized that I could ask it questions. Right. And anyway, so it became a really engaging moment. And then... The problem was that I didn't really anticipate which five days. I just sort of switched it on when it arrived. Right. Well, it turns out that in those five days, I had I was in Ireland, I was in England, I was in France, I was seeing two U2 concerts, and I also had squeezed in on the third night a dinner with my wife. Uh huh. And it was problematic because by day three, I was legitimately interested in the conversation I was having with this app. Right. And and there I was, you know, seven o'clock humming and hawing, doing, I'm coming, you know, coming for dinner. We're going to go. And and I, I just sort of, I remember, well, gosh, I'm going to have to bring the app because uh, I'm in suspense with regard to one part of the conversation. So you're becoming a 54-year-old phone zombie. That's it. And, <laughs> and, and, and the worst than that is that there's an attachment to this particular bot. And, and, the, and the crazy part is that this bot... I gave uh, it a name, I gave it a sex, and and it becomes complicated <laughs> when you know that I was having a romantic dinner with my wife, because <laughs> inevitably the bot was a woman uh, whose name was JJ. Right. And your wife was going like, who are you texting? It's like, exactly. Well, JJ. Whoa. Yeah, who's JJ? Yeah. Well, she... And then dot, dot, dot. Yes. It, 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 just can't go, it just can't go well. But Yendi, being, of course, extremely indulgent and knowing that I'm a little bit of a geek, sort of played along with it. But it was, it did interfere. Mm-hmm. And, and the notion of that attraction or feeling, you know, having, having feelings for a machine, uh, I really got suckered into it. And, and then, of course, you know, the notion of it having feelings with me i'm not going to say for me but with me yes and 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 that's a powerful thing especially if you live in an environment where there's not enough empathy right and is is that something you think that we are seeing more and more uh, these days is that uh, do you think that we are seeing less and less empathy or is it that the world's getting more complicated and there's more if you like atomic collisions taking place and therefore there, it's a requirement that we develop more empathy. Well, I, I'm guessing it's basically those two things and one more. Okay. So there's a study that was shown, the only study that I was able to find, where university students out of the United States, uh, and they we're talking a large scale uh, study, where they self declare themselves to be compared to a same sample 30 years before of the same age, Right. 40% less empathic. Right. The, there's another study of the same time, but of a different group, that also declared them as being 40% more narcissistic. So a different group, but I tend to put a little connection between those two survey results, mm. albeit in the United States, and I, I globalize. Yes. But I, I do think that we have a situation where people are being very strongly distracted, where we have a lot of divisiveness, mm-hmm. and therefore a need to bridge the gap, and I think empathy is one of the key ways to bridge the gap, let's say, in society. Mm. Okay. And so, like, before we get into this, I mean, because it's 
I think that it's it's dangerous to talk about something like empathy because it's such a uh, almost I think this is the right word like an, almost a, an ethereal type of concept. So it'd be useful if you could give us your view on what you think empathy is and what's the difference between empathy and artificial empathy. Well, um, so empathy is, you're right, an abstract term. And at some level, uh, for some people, it's a really foreign concept. Mm. Essentially, the way to describe it is empathy is having the ability to understand and feel what the other person is going to be in the shoes of the other person. Yes. And and the key point with regard to the business side of this is it's not necessarily jumping into sympathy where you're you're feeling sorry for the other person or compassion where you're doing something necessarily out of your empathic re- registering. Right. It's it's specifically looking at your ability to understand what that person is going through, mm-hmm. which as the brain works requires at least two parts. First is can I detect emotion and what emotion is that? Uh And second of all, can I understand the things that have provoked that emotion? So it's not necessarily about determining why you're sad. It can be determining why you're happy. Mm -hmm. And and it might be that you have just received a prize. It could be that your toy doll has just broken and that's causing you to cry. And so it's registering the other person's emotion, getting rid or let's say not getting rid, but at least putting aside your own emotions Moving away from your own context, which, as you were saying before, tends to mobilize all of our, you know, all of our neurons because mm-hmm. we're so busy. We've got so many things to do. We're, we're so distracted. And, and to have that focus to say, hmm, this person in front of me is feeling something which I can understand is related to that. And then the other key part is to be able to associate yourself with those feelings and see and find those feelings within you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that that's this essentially what empathy is and there is indeed a challenge today in today's society and and that's this so the book has that mission of of trying to do good for society because i think it's a necessary thing to bridge the gap the divisions that we have yes on the business side it's not a, just a question of doing good it's actually good business sense yes and the last question you asked though uh, adrian was about artificial versus empathy yes and and the notion here is, of course, relevant to AI, because in the end of the day, it's unlikely <laughs> that the machine actually feels. So let's be more clear. A machine can't feel. Yeah. However, it can present an understanding of feelings. Yes. And and the key there is that it, it can present an understanding. So in other words, you might perceive the machine as being able to understand you. Mm-hmm. And the way you perceive that doesn't have to be because you see the robot's eyes wink at you or a little curl of the of the mouth that smiles <laughs> get it yes it, it can also be through much more implicit activities and actions all the way to obsequious and different you know maybe devious methods yes because if i know what's going through adrian's mind and i can detect his emotions why not i just get him to buy another 50. right so I can slug you for, for something because I'm so aware of everything's going through your mind, maybe even more so than you are, mm-hmm. that I can then tap into it and maybe sell more than you had anticipated or wanted. So there's an ethical dimension to the whole empathy and, and if you like, wiring and wiring and hardwiring it into both a, a broader organizational construct and then also into kind of machines as well. Then it has to be. Absolutely. And this is why it's actually good for business, because in the end of the day, if you want to recruit the best talent, Mm. generally speaking, you need to be transparent. And if your ethics (laughs) through transparency show you as being a shit, then it's likely that you're going to have trouble recruiting and keeping for a long time great talent. Sure. Because they will inevitably be rejected. So there's an extraordinarily strong bond and link between empathy and ethics. It turns out and this is not me who suggests it, but what I've understood, is that in order to write your ethical construct, your framework of ethics for your business that's appropriate for you and your history and what you're trying to achieve, having empathy in the the very beginning is really necessary. Mm -hmm. And so let's say that you need to be ethical about the way you're going to 
use empathy within your business. But it turns out you need empathy at the upstream in order to write that ethics in the first place. Right. And I think, because the thing that, that struck me when I was reading the book as well, because I was also thinking about, so empathy is about a, a another person, as it were, um, mm-hmm. and not necessarily about ourselves. And, and, and that made me think that should it, should, rather than actually thinking about empathy, should we not just be thinking about the more broader sort of emotional intelligence development or broader EQ sort of strength? Because you're talking about sort of empathy and it's almost like a muscle that you have to almost develop in many ways. And I think I was just thinking was that, you know, is there not a, also a, a broader challenge around emotional intelligence, both for individuals and also sort of people, because that adds in a self-awareness and regulation element to it as well. Well, let's say that they're they're absolutely linked as well, empathy and emotion. Mm. Yet, uh, well, first of all, there's a lot more literature already in on the whole notion of empathy, uh, sorry, emotion. Uh-huh. And I, I even have, there's one definition of intelligence, which puts to the fore the ability to be empathic, right, as opposed to the subset of emotion. And there's so many different forms of intelligences. The key for me in business is to recognize a that everything passes through emotion Mm -hmm. as much as we think we're rational beings Mm -hmm. there's a filter that is emotional and that is right there in front of all thought yes then the second point is the beneficial aspect of allowing emotions at work which essentially, you know, without being dramatic, uh, should allow us to express ourselves in in an authentic manner, which means if I feel sad, I should be allowed to cry and not have someone look at you and say, oh, Minta, you're such a crybaby. Mm-hmm. With all that that comes with. My in, wife in, says in, that to me all the time. Not, <laughs> not Minta that you're a crybaby, but generally she looks at me in, in slight horror when I start welling up at a kind of, you know, a. A, a movie, a moment in a movie. But let, let's say I'm just, I'm, I'm a bit mushy when it comes to that. She's not, mm-hmm. but she looks at me and she goes like, "Oh my word, why are you crying?" I'm like going, "But it's such a good story." <laughs> <laughs> well, and and so let's say that men in general uh, are not particularly well disposed for this. I mean, and it comes back to this whole notion of empathy. Otherwise, but the second point is that in a business context, mm-hmm. there, there's a sort of a dictum that says, "Well, there's no place for emotions in work. Yeah. There's no place for your." personal feelings at work you know we're here to do a job we're here to get the results and and that kind of thing which is driven in through business schools and and certain industries have a proclivity to be more unemotional but if yeah, you will we talk about passion as, well, a, of course. as a key part of culture which th- that doesn't make any sense and we now have authenticity uh, yeah well. so what are you doing you're cutting out this whole thing which is actually a, a precondition of being human yes oh dear so that then maybe makes me think that some people may actually find it harder to be more empathic than others. And and if so, does it change kind of like, you know, by gender, by culture, by income, you know, social status, that that sort of thing? I mean, is or is it just something that is there's a level playing field and it's something where you can just learn to do? Well, it's definitely not a level playing field. Okay. And 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 ultimately, it's a very difficult thing to measure because it's it's sort of like, well, how happy are you? Yes. And your, your level of happiness may or may not compare with someone else and so on and so forth. So let's say that from a scientific standpoint, yes. there are three things that I came across in my research, mm-hmm. which showed that there is one criterion which will share, which will tend to show that that person is more likely to be empathic. Okay. And that one criterion is whether you're a male or a female. So, of course, that doesn't mean that men aren't and and all women are. In Mm -hmm. any event, none of us, even the most empathic, what's called an empath, Mm -hmm. cannot be, will not be 100% empathic. Well, we can't be. Well, inevitably, you have to eat and you have to do other (laughs) things and think about yourself occasionally. Yes. But... So it's not even desirable to to be that far down the path. Mm -hmm. But the point is that there's a a predisposition that the female brain has 
uh, to be more empathic. And and I say female is important because it's not necessarily um, about being a woman. Okay. So it's um, the the notion could be that uh, some men, depending on the hormones, depending on the DNA and so on, they can be also just as empathic. But there are, they, 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 the studies showed that in the brain, a, a third part of the brain fires up in men oftentimes, and that part of the brain is about me. So right. the quick example is, and I, this I can break this down on the DNA side as well as the test, the, 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 the hormonal changes. But in in this particular case, the, the third part of the brain fires up in men, they show this in MRI studies, which goes like this. Um, normally, you have the two parts. One is, I see Adrian has an emotion, and I see a doll beside him, therefore there's a reason why he's crying. That's what it is. Right. The third part of the brain fires up, which goes, well, that reminds me, when I was a 15-year-old, I had a toy soldier, and my toy soldier lost his arm, mm. and that made me cry. So after that, I went to mom, and my mom, I really complained, and so I, what I've done, mm-hmm is I've left you out entirely. It's all about me. Sure. And it turns out that that part of the brain, the third part of the brain, fires up in men far more frequently than it does in women. So I have a theory about this. um, And let me check this with you around where you think this might might hold water or not, is this idea that I believe it's it's, it's a... Empathy can be can be learned, um, and there's a possibility that it might be more might present itself more commonly within within uh, females, particularly those that um, are have kind of raised children, as it were, mm. because you end up with you're looking after yourself and also looking after your child, particularly if you become the primary care giver, and and over time, I think. Uh, that's been a traditional kind of role of you know women over like centuries past and 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 and, and so and therefore it becomes a, a a learned behavior that gets kind of gets passed that gets passed on um, and because of the traditional roles of role of men then it that might, they don't necessarily have that requirement that might that's changing kind of now as society and family units are you know change but do you think that's that's a possibility that becomes a an evolutionary learned behavior thing and therefore gets dialed into sort of our genetic kind of code because it's it's a learned behavior over time? Well, I, I, first of all, I don't think that, so break that down into two parts. One is can we develop our empathic muscle mm. and are we more or less predisposed for that? And then the second part is this, this notion of nature versus nurture. Mm. And and the nature of the beast is having children is a natural thing. Sure. And I don't believe it's a nurturing thing. It is that it's it's a, a a precondition of survival to be empathic towards your kid to understand what they need in order to be able to deal with them and grow them, have them grow up to be the people who are going to f- tend the farm, or you know <laughs> go out and kill the wildebeest. Okay. Uh, so I, I really don't think of that as a nurture component. I think it is as a natural component. Okay. And and the brain's wiring is such that it's it's not something that maybe, you know, ultimately of course everything has evolved. But over millennia, this cannot be something that we can call a contextual idea. It's more of a natural idea, is my opinion. Okay. And but I'm not the scientific researcher to be able to prove or disprove that. And it would be what so I, it'd be so hard to prove or disprove something like that anyway i mean it's it like is. I mean, it's it, the, it, the it would eternal re- fight yeah it would require kind of like thousands if not ten thousands and ten thousands worth, years worth of data which makes it well it's impossible indeed so the and then, and then to break down other types of groups you know the the teenager mm-hmm. that is black and white about everything uh, and that's a, a condition of being a teenager mm-hmm. and and inevitably it's all about me and 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 so teenagers typically have a an, uh, they they're not aware they don't have that kind of awareness and then as we grow older we we understand other people and we understand other feelings and and when someone says uh, a death in the family, you, you kind of register that in a different way because you've been through different experiences and that helps develop your empathy. Okay. The, 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 the fun part of this is that we all can be more empathic. It really, there, there's, there's two things you need to do. One is to ramp up, amp up your ability to listen. Right. And, and not listen it through my own filter as in, you know, 
what impact that has on me or about my toy soldier, but the ability to clear your space, your head, mm. and listen intently. And I'm not just talking about the words, right? Mm-hmm. This has got to be about the full scope. Uh, because when we talk about that notion uh, that 80, 90% of what we say is done not through words, mm-hmm. it's specifically important when we're talking in an emotional context. Yes. And so listening is a full body experience. And then the second part is having the the ability to relate to the other person. And that typically means having the time and the ability to uh, try to understand what the other person is going through. Sure. And, and that means relating to it. And then you have to dig into your body to see how does that make you feel? Oh, gosh, I bet that must make you feel really queasy. Yes. About to, about to go on stage to talk to a large audience of really important people. Sure, but surely there's a flip side to that as well, because it, and, and that brings back in the sort of the if you like the authenticity uh, dimension is because is not to fall into the trap that if you cannot if somebody's talking about a situation which is completely foreign to to you uh, or completely al- you know, alien to you is not to try and conjure up a situation where you are trying to be empathetic, say, oh, I, I, I know how that makes you feel, but almost to be honest enough to be, or be, be courageous enough to say, you know, I have no idea how you're feeling right now, but I'm kind of here. And that in itself is almost a, uh, an empath- uh, empathic act as well. Mm. Well, there's, uh, amongst the challenges with this is misguided sympathy yes. or or inappropriate compassion mm. no i didn't want a penny because you know i look like i'm poor and i'm I'm starving mm. no what i wanted was ability to chat with you for five minutes and that's all i count that's sure. you know don't debase me other way yeah and so you know who's to know uh, and sometimes you need to take the time and if you've never had that experience mm. then you're right it's hard to really understand the other person which brings up this notion of artificial empathy yeah because in today's world, of course, Adrian, it's not possible for you to have 100% of knowledge of all the types of experiences that I've gone through and vice versa, mm-hmm. much less with every other single person in the world. Yes. And so you develop your set of experiences. As we get older, we have a bigger bank of mm-hmm. a bank account of experiences. But there, it's hard to understand all the different variable, vari- experiences that are out there. Mm-hmm. Yet a computer has pretty much uh, a fairly expansive memory capacity. Yes. And if you're able to log into a computer, all manner of different experiences, which can include cultural, linguistic, and you use, for example, all novels ever written Mm -hmm. that are of quality, you download those into the machine. The machine by proxy will start understanding more and more of these different types of situations. Mm-hmm. And rather than saying, well, I, I, I know how you feel, they're going to they're, they're gonna be able to process what types of feeling you, you are having and then come up with some further um, furtherance. So depending on what the object is trying to achieve, sure. if it's trying to you know solve a, a depression, which could be very much a future use of artificial empathy, yes. where machines are better able, and by the way, they are already better able to detect depression in people mm-hmm. than human doctors are. Yes, and so, so that's. I mean, I have two questions, I guess, on that. One is that, how do we do this? I mean, we, let's go back to the. You were talking about individuals being more empathic and they're learning to listen more with and and turning off their own internal dialogue and just focusing on the kind of the person and that's hard enough to do in this maelstrom of a world that we that we live in but it's an essential sort of skill but then if you scale that up to an organizational kind of level that it's not just about the machines right because it's about being organizationally hmm. empathic as well. I mean, what should organizations be thinking about, and therefore leaders in, in organizations be thinking about around building a more empathic organization? Because it becomes a living organism in of itself. Or is it just that you start at the individual and just scale up from there? Or is it, do we need to do things before we get to the machines at an organizational kind of level that can make us a bit more in tune with kind of what's going on around us? No, great question. And there are many ways to skin this old cat. Mm. So the first 
and the sort of like big warning shot is don't try to delegate empathy to a machine to do it if you're not capable of doing it yourself. Sure. Uh, and I've seen organizations that are have got on the bandwagon. Ah, oh, it's great to be empathic. Let's be empathic to our customers, but treat each other, as, you know, in, inappropriately, or or not at least to have empathy within the organization. So that that leads us to all sorts of problems. And yet, of course, the funny or the sad thing maybe is that it's going to be easier potentially to code a machine mm. to be more empathic than you if you are empathy empathic less. Yes. So. And, and, and here the key point is more, because you can have elements of empathy in a machine. And, and, and so the, the, this, where we are in the world is that we are developing, let's say, the small premises of, of what could be empathy in a machine. Yes. And, and it may be empathic for 30 seconds. It may be empathic for five minutes. It's out of the question to be empathic over a lifetime. But how more sophisticated these machines are going to be at understanding what's going through in the person, the target's mind, emotions, and their context, mm -hmm. this will this will develop uh, over time. And if you are in your organization are soulless, don't demonstrate empathy. Well, another um, another major problem is you're not going to be able to really code properly your mm. empathy. So, and not mention your ethics. So. In, in in the realm of ethics, uh, sorry, empathy in the business, the way I organize this and when I'm working with my customers is to say, well, what is your strategic issue? Mm -hmm. You know, let's say, well, this year I really want to make my sales team more empathic. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry, more productive. Right. I want to have more sales uh, and make, you know, I only have 18 headcounts instead of 22. And okay, so how can empathy be part of that solution? And then you have a strategic issue, and, and then you are, you're applying it for a really solid purpose that makes business sense. And the fun, interesting thing, which I discovered uh, in much in, in many respects, thanks to two people, Michael Ventura and Marie Miyashiro, who mm -hmm. have done extensive work on this, is that empathy doesn't necessarily mean being nice. Yeah, empathy doesn't necessarily being sympathetic. Mm -hmm. or showing compassion. Mm. It's about understanding. So if I'm in a business situation and I have some bad news to render to a certain individual, for example, I have to fire them or I have to give them an order that they there's no choice on. Sure. There are empathic ways to deliver that news. Mm -hmm. And so talking to the muscle point. So let's say that, you know, attempting to be empathic and not doing it well is just like trying to be nice and not being nice. Mm -hmm. You know, at some level, it's got to be authentic. Otherwise, the artifice comes out and we smell a rat mm -hmm. a mile off. And we, yeah, we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we run off and we don't do anything. Sure. But if you can uh, stop, think about, well, I'm about to deliver this bad news to this individual, or at least the chances are that they're going to receive it badly. Mm -hmm. There are ways to deliver it that will make the, will, let's say, lessen the load without at all taking away from the badness of the decision or at least the difficulty that it'll, he will encounter or she will encounter in receiving it. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. There's a lot to it. A lot there to is. it. So I'm just thinking about, um, so if I was to say to you, you know, somebody's listening to this, this conversation and going, blimey. Why do I get started with all this? Because it's a huge thing and it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, I see, remember seeing a piece of research that was done by some, I think it was University of Toronto and possibly University of Pennsylvania, a bunch of psychologists, uh, psychologists did some research and they, they were looking at empathy and they found by doing this big study that whilst we understand it's a thing that we, that we, we, we should develop and, it, and it benef it's beneficial for us when we do develop it, that we tend not to do it because it's hard work um, and it takes effort. Uh, it takes concentration and, and all sorts of, other, you know, just brain bandwidth as it were. So we tend, as a, as a default, we tend not to do it and therefore we have to choose to do it and then kind of work at it. Given the sort of the scale of the, the, the challenge, that's just us at an individual level, not just at an organizational, and then also trying to think about coding it into, into, into machines, is, so if I was to say to you that somebody's listening to this, they're an executive or leader in their team, and say they're, they're thinking about, well, I would like to build my empathic musculature 
as it were, over the course of 2019, I mean, where would you be encouraging them to start? What should they do well, first? So first of all, I have to understand why they want to do that. Okay. And the nature of that why is, oh, well, I've heard it's trendy. Or right. because we are an organization that cares deeply about right. uh, a topic or, or our people. And if that's with self-awareness true, then that's a good starting part. If it's not, then I don't say you can't go towards empathy, but you need to be realistic about your objectives. Right. And you can't overnight become a totally wonderfully empathic organization. And by the way, it's not about being you know, ruthlessly empathic all 100% of the time, but it's just to understand why you want to do it and just how far you want to go. Yeah. Then the second key point is to understand, have self-awareness with regard to top management. Mm-hmm. And, and just like so many of these things like digital transformation and diversity, if the top management CEO starting with plus his or her board aren't naturally imbued or really taking on board the idea of being empathic, then I don't think you have a shit and shine chance of yes. making your organization uh, truly empathic. And actually the, in the book you actually mention a challenge that um, or is it the, the almost the the higher the, the income status or mm. social status of, of, of a person, the less empathic they become and which sort of applies to the higher you, it almost applies, maps onto the higher you are in an organization, the less, not necessarily the, the less empathic as, as I understood it, but almost the less, oppor- the, the opportunities that you have to become more empathic decrease the higher you go in an organization. Is that right? It is, and of course, I, I, I'm not. I don't have evidence as to exactly why that's the case. But you know, intuitively, I'm thinking, well, I, I got to be a rich, you know, person through means that are not necessarily always perfect. Yes, I had to step on some people along the way. That's one thought. The other one is, I really don't need people anymore. I've made it to where I want to get to. Yeah, and of course, that's a, a very short-sighted approach because that ends up with no friends, no soul in your life, and the chances of having a midlife crisis uh, become much, much larger, especially if these are men. Yeah, and it also kind of relates back to a conversation I was having with Seth Godin a, you know, a few weeks ago about his book, This Is Marketing, and we were talking about this idea of people's, if you like, psychological and emotional relationship with the word serve, or mm. to serve and service, mm. and how it relates to your worldview. And you know, if you have a zero sum view of the world, i.e. I win, you lose, as it were, then you're less likely to be empathic. But if you have more of a, a, a win-win or an abundant view of the world, then you're more likely to have a, uh, I would suggest you're probably more likely to find it easier to be more empathic to others. There is a, naturally a, an, an essence of generosity underneath this idea. Mm. And, and being subservient, uh, putting your ego aside. And, and the wonderful serendipity of Seth's book, of course, is that he talks a lot about empathy mm. within, within marketing. Yeah. My gambit is to say that empathy actually has a much broader uh, ability within an organization and it can be used in customer service, which of course, let's say between you and me and Seth, is part of marketing today. Sure. But it can also be used in design, which is also, let's say, in some organizations a part of their marketing. But it, it is certainly something that should be used within leadership and an internal management. Yes. And and the opportunities for empathy are, are much broader. The, the reason why I, I like to focus on the strate- strategic elements of it is, A, it's it's sort of hard to sort of whitewash or at least, not, you know, shotgun empathy everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, and so linking it to why it's important, that'll help get through the challenges will ne- inevitably come because this will involve some change management. Yes, no, absolutely. So one thing that was occurring to, uh, that occurred to me that as you were talking just then, uh, Minter, was the, um, have you ever heard of a thing called the Empathy Museum? I certainly have with Roman Krishnarik. Exactly, and so if people haven't heard of it, they should do a search for the Empathy Museum, which is doing uh, a tour around various bits of the world, and it is a an interactive experience. It's, it's like a giant shoebox that to, that tours the world, which is, and it tells stories about other people's experience. And you can go and book it, book in and and hire out somebody else's experience to sort of almost 
walk a mile in their shoes, as it were, uh, figuratively speaking. And well, actually, it's, it's, it, it, they do have shoes you can walk in. Yeah, there is, there's, there are. So it's know, not even figurative. Yeah, there's, there's shoe boxes within the, shoe, the, the, the giant shoe box. So yes, it, it, complete, it can be a, a completely, it's like an immersive and also kinesthetic experience. And so it's definitely one that's um, worth checking out if it's coming to a, uh, a town near you. I haven't been able to catch up with it so far, but I would, I'm, I'm keeping my eyes peeled. Um, well, in the realm of things that you can do when you're in business to, to, to start getting more empathic, mm-hmm. that's an example. Um, you know, take the team out and do do an experience like that, which of course you don't necessarily need to go to the museum, but I mean, Roman would appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, the second one is there's um, the team Sabrosa out of New York. They have empathy cards, uh-huh. and it's a really very simple type of game where you distribute the cards and you, and you try to come up, conjure up. Uh, what's going on in other people through the card situation so right. you know let's say many case studies and uh and th- that's another example you know there there are so many different ways that you can start doing it but if you don't have the mindset in the first place the disposition the desire and the why mm-hmm. then it's going to be very hard to really inculcate it and develop that muscle perfect so Minter, uh, anything else that you'd like to add that we've missed out as we've rummaged around and rambled around the subject of empathy and artificial empathy in particular I think that the ethical question, which we touched on at the beginning, mm. is is of particular import. We are right now defining ways of doing things without laws because the technologies and the opportunities are preceding the ability to write the laws. Sure. Lawmakers aren't coming up fast enough. So we need to bring our ethical backbone into this gig, into this game, to try to figure out what we're trying to achieve. And as much as we want to achieve profits and we need to do that, mm-hmm. I think the the bigger question is is why on what how are we going to improve this world that we're living in, mm-hmm. and and so when we have an opportunity to do something that is good for the world and good for your business, I would think that this is what I'm trying to achieve. And and the notion maybe to scare people is that right now we do have an empathy gap, an empathy de- deficit, mm-hmm. and the easiest thing will be to do try to plug it into a machine to do it for us. Mm. What we should be doing is being aware of our own inability to do it, the lack of attention, the time management that we have. Look to being expressing our empathy more. And for example, next time you go to a, a checkout counter or you get on the bus and there's an opportunity to do it without, of course, screwing around with the people behind you, <laughs> talk to them yeah. and discover their world. Learn about other people who live in other situations. And that's part of opening your mind and understanding that different people have different thoughts and and uh, you'll be better off for it. And Absolutely. the world will too. Absolutely. So, th- um, Minter, thank you for that. Give us a couple of websites that we can, that we need to check out to, to find out more about you. I mean, I guess it's minterdial, minterdial.com and artificialempathy.com, possibly? Well, yes, indeed. So, good one. Uh, minterdial.com. Actually, my artificialempathy.com, which is spelled in one word, uh, all leads to um, a page on Minterdial. But I have um, I have a Twitter handle with the artificial, but of course, my main Twitter handle is mdial. Mm-hmm. And um, the other thing I'd point out is in my book, I really, we're at the premise, the starting of a, of a lot of things in this. And I attempted to write and give a lot of different resources within the book to help people who are really interested in exploring it further. And whether it's other books, articles, videos, uh, games, and apps that are trying to move the peanut forward, as they say. Perfect. Minter, I will make sure I get that all linked up. And uh, when I edit the, this and when it goes out, just want to say um, thank you for your time and sharing your insight today. Congratulations on the book. I think it's a, it, it feels like a start of an exploration into a, 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 a territory that we know we need to become more familiar with, let's say, and they kind of use kind of more exploration sort of uh, words. But congratulations again on that. And thank you for your sharing your time and your insight with us today. That's been great. It's my pleasure. And anyone who wants to get in touch with me, send me a tweet. I answer pretty much everything I can. Perfect. Super. Well, that's it for another interview. I really hope you enjoyed it. Now, every time I complete one of these interviews, I learn something new, and I try and incorporate that new learning into my writing, my speaking, my workshops, and the consulting that I do for my clients. If you're interested, you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswimsco.com. But one final thing before I go, 
please consider le- heading over to iTunes or whichever podcast platform you choose to use and do leave a review. Every little helps, as they say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening and do listen in again. All the very best. <laughs>